implicit biases are reflecting our actual lived experience. So it is less pleasant uh, to be from a minority <laughs> in, our, in, in America. It is uh, more likely that you're, you have, you're associated with domestic things than career things if you're a woman compared to if you're a man, right? So those things are a part of our lived experience. And, and because of AI, we were able to measure that. We were able to find, so we originally were looking to see whether it was true that implicit biases could be recovered through AI. Welcome to a whole new episode from Gati CX. I'm your host, Aish, and today, folks, you're in for a treat. We have a scientist with us on the show today. But before I introduce you to our incredible guest, allow me to introduce you to the magic of Ngati. Ngati is the world's leading multilingual no-code chatbot platform, available across 14 channels with 35,000 bots, created across 186 countries in every domain and use case. Ngati has also been recognized as a top platform by Inc.com, Tech World, CIO, and many others. We run the Ngati blog, video channel, and the Ngati CX podcast, receiving upwards of 400,000 visitors annually. And now for our guest. Joanna is the professor of ethics and technology at the, at the Hurdy School, who specializes in natural and artificial intelligence. Her current research focuses on the accountability and the transparency in AI, and understanding the cultural and technological impact of the cooperation between digital technologies and humans. This includes economic and political behavior, and national and transnational governance, and the political economy and technological revolution, regulation. In her research for systems AI, Joanna looks for methods that promotes the ease and safety of, de of developing AI. She believes good systems make AI autonomy easier to build, understand, control, and account for. So welcome to the show, Joanna. We're thrilled to have you. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, let me just correct one thing. It's not just good systems, so of course that helps, but it's good systems engineering. So the point is that people often forget that AI is something that we've developed. And so even though we do use the machines to do some of the work for us, it is still us that choose how we structure that entire process. My apologies. <laughs> so welcome to the show, Joanna. Um, before we dive into our first question, remember to subscribe to our channel and tap the bell icon to get access to exclusive content from thought leaders from around the globe. So my first question for you, Joanna, is what checks and balances have to be put into place to avoid the misuse of AI technology by governments and private companies? <laughs> no, nothing major there. But um, I mean, first of all, I mean, you, you can see that there are problems that go beyond the digital itself. So um, both the United States and the United Kingdom right now, uh, they, were, they were number one and number two for pandemic preparedness, uh, according to the World Health Organization. And then in both countries, we had uh, governments elected that chose not to uh, follow the plans that, and, and to throw out the preparation. So that has resulted in an enormous loss of life, right? So the, here's mm -hmm. something, the checks and balances of government are a problem um, anyway. And, and artificial intelligence absolutely alters that. In both cases, there are questions about how uh, social media was used not so much to change people's minds about like who to vote for, but to ch change people's minds about whether to vote, right? Mm -hmm. so, so you can disenfranchise people by telling them that neither party really uh, supports them or no party really supports them or that they need to vote for a very unlikely minority party or that basically the political process is corrupt and they should stay home. And then other people, we can go out and find them and say, oh, you seem to have the political uh, thoughts we want, so let's encourage you. Let's show you that you can find other people with a similar uh, disposition online and convince you that you're winning. And then, and then they go out and they're more active. So, um, so those kinds of processes, and, and maybe other ones, who knows, uh, could have had impacts on these elections. But the point is that you can't just say that it's an AI problem by itself or this, well, you could kind of say it's a governance problem anyway, and the governance problem is changing. So, but we do need to have those basic institutions. We need to invest, we need to pay tax, we need to set up structures that work. And then of course, uh, there's that question about, well, why were people able to get that information? Um, why, were, why was it for sale, right? So, so Facebook had already been in trouble for, uh, for the kinds of information people were getting. In 2014, they signed up to a bunch of things. The British actually found Facebook guilty of having violated their previous agreements, but unfortunately the maximum charge they had at that time for, for messing with an election was two million pounds, which oh is nothing to Facebook. So, so, so um, 
Britain said, we hope that other, you know, other governments, uh, you know, because they can't do double jeopardy, but they, just, they said, we hope that other governments also give the maximum possible fine um, and that theirs is higher. <laughs> okay. And the EU has just made it. So part of the GDPR is that their, their highest uh, fine is something like, I don't remember, it's a percentage, like three or 4% of the turnover, right? Mm-hmm. So for that, for that, that obviously goes much higher than 2 million pounds for Facebook. Um, but also, if you look at what the Democrat uh, scientists in the United States just proposed, that, that can be take that information from these court cases. So, so there's like, processes going on there are checks and balances but actually let's let's drop down to something going back to that systems engineering thing i talked about before so one of the things we want to know again it doesn't have to be facebook it can be smaller places like the clearview cloudflare you know i think cloudflare is great but but you if you're uh far right you might not agree with me <laughs> because because they pulled the plug on uh so what cloud cloudflare um provide uh um, protection against like denial of service attacks. So they, they provide cybersecurity of, of a type, right? Mm-hmm. And they just decided not to protect a particular fascist website anymore. Oh my right? God. They could just do that. And so the question is, and they're pretty open about it, that they just made that decision. People have been telling them to make that decision and they kept saying, no, 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 that's not our business model. We're not in the business of deciding who's good and who's bad. We're just trying to make the web safer for everyone. And then one day the owner woke up and said, you know, screw it. <laughs> and pulled the plug, you know, and, and, that, and so that's a really interesting question. Mm-hmm. You know, that it was a private corporation; they could make that choice, right? Um, right. But the but the but anyway, if in Facebook, so that guy is open about like his decision making process, and that he's perturbed about having that much power and whatever. Facebook uh, is less likely to tell you what they're thinking, but. Um, the, the question, and we're trying to make this very clear, more and more governments are getting it. The European Union seems to be getting it. That software is like any other manufactured product. You know, that people keep looking for the, the, the exceptions. And of course, yes, there are certain things that are different. For example, that's digital. So, so that it can be transferred across national borders at very, very low cost. Not free, yeah. not zero time, not instantaneous. There's no omniscience, there's no AGI. But nevertheless, it is a total radical change in what distance means, in what um, in what uh, what ownership means. You know, so so there's a lot of things that have been challenged by the um, you know, that, that are challenged by the digital. But anyway, the point is, nevertheless, a software program is a manufactured product, mm-hmm. and I think the thing that confuses people is that some of those products then deliver services, right? And so they think, oh, it's a service, but it's like no. There's a product delivering a service, okay? So that's the thing that I'm hoping is, is evident uh, to, to people. Mm-hmm. And, that, and so, as, so I, it's funny because I, I actually, um, I, I'm doing a project about how large consultancies are sort of uh, uh, corrupting the world's governments by, by taking all their money away. And yes, I'm also doing a project with a large consultancy <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, EY. And, uh, and they, they were saying that, look, we've gone in and we've, we've gone in and people aren't keeping those records that you say are there. They could, you know, I said, no, no, I said they could be there. And mm-hmm. so that's the main thing. People talk in this terms of like tech determinant, you know, like, like, like that the, there's an absolute way, like, like a deterministic, I forgot what's it called, techno determinism, you know, that because we've discovered this thing, inevitably there's certain kinds of things that happen. That's not how life works, right? Mm-hmm. We have the choices to make about whether or not we go and prosecute uh, when, and, and ask for those records. And then if those records aren't there, it's not because you couldn't have kept them. It's because you didn't keep them. Right. And if it was an automotive company and they didn't keep those records, they would be nailed for liability, for, for lack of due diligence, <laughs> you know, everything. And we need to get, we just need to communicate the same thing to the software people. That, I mean, not to the, to the people prosecuting the software people. Mm-hmm. So that leads me to my next question. So how can we make large corporations like Facebook or Google, how can we hold them accountable for algorithms that misbehave? Right. Well, yeah, so we're getting, we're getting into that right there. And I just want to say it's not only large corporations. That is one of the natures of, of uh, the digital, that, that small corporations can have things that Definitely. go wrong. And also... I think it's because uh, they're the, lo- the louder voices. So yeah. that's why people kind of target them. Well, yeah, so let's start with the smaller and then go to the bigger and say, how are they yes. different? Okay. 
and smaller can include governments themselves. So they sometimes go out and get software, like for the, famously the recidivism thing that happened, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody went out and procured that software. And the people I know that work in machine learning say they can't figure out how to make, you know, take that data and do that bad of a job. So that makes it look like it might have been in the procurement that, you know, the job was to keep people of color in, in jail and, and let white people out. And of course, white is color too. But anyway, <laughs> I don't know if the, the current, you know, what, what I should have been saying there. But you see what I'm trying to say. Yeah. The point is that, that um, if we don't have good records kept for any procurement system, whether, whether it's Ameri you know, like America, the whole country, or if it's, um, if it's just like a little police department, or if it's a little company, if we don't know what people were trying to do when they wrote the software, what procedures they followed, how they validated it, then they should be found uh, uh, at, at a minimum guilty of negligence for not re retaining that information about mm -hmm. what they did and, th and that they tested it and, and that they made, checked these things. The first time you didn't realize that machines could be biased, you know, that, you know, it's okay, you know, you, you missed that, right? That, or we as a society missed that. But now mm -hmm. we know. Now we understand that the biases that are in our, are in our society, if we use our data to train machines, will make machines exactly the same by us, right? Exactly. So now we have to go back and check those things. And, mm -hmm. and so, so everyone should be able to prove they went back and checked those things. And if they can't prove it, then I would, I would consider it evidence of a crime at this stage. It's, it's that the, in the least case, it wasn't following due diligence, you know, but mm -hmm. it might have been deliberate. And so that that so that's what you do in general, that, you know, with governments with small companies. The problems of the large companies are that they have so much power. I mean, right. it's just ridiculous. And the last time we had this level of inequality, we got World War One. So it, it isn't just about it isn't just about the corporations. I honestly think that um, the the. The, I don't like the people talk about digital tax. I think we should be talking about transnational tax, maybe wealth mm -hmm. tax, because the digital companies like Facebook, like Google, actually their interests are aligned with liberal democracies. They don't always see that. They, for some reason, they have libertarian things going in their head and they think that like, oh, all regulation is bad, mm -hmm. even though they've been upregulated their entire lives, right? So the, right. the um, money has been poured into their development and their, power, their empowerment, right? But anyway, nevertheless, they think regulation is bad, even though it's like what they exist on, or they did exist on. Now they exist mm -hmm. on advertising revenue or whatever, <laughs> and, and they uh, and so they're fighting the things that would help stabilize uh, the help stabilize their their business model, right? Because if you know if if we can't solve things like climate change, if we if we can't uh, keep people well educated and 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 with good jobs and with money in their pockets, then their entire business model disappears. Mm -hmm. So I think I think that we should uh, I, I don't think we should demonize the large companies. I do think we need to uh, can, we need to, they shouldn't have that much money and they need to sign up with and 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 you know it's funny that it depends by the company, but the people I've talked to at Facebook. Um, are basically like, yeah, we know something has to change. And the right. people I've talked to at Google are like, we know something has to change, but we don't like legislation with, with only our name in it. Mm -hmm. And actually, one of my colleagues at Princeton, uh, Nolan McCarty, says, well, then they shouldn't uh, have a complete monopoly on, on industry because, of course, <laughs> then when you regulate that industry, you regulate them, right? Right. But then, yeah, so I actually think one of the things we could do is mandate that the tech giants do compete with each other. Because it's like Airbus, right? You know, Airbus for a long time was only there, um, you know, like, you know, it's a disaster, you know, this EU thing, you know, like, so like the, everything is in a different language and it's like this incredible complexity. But then after that, you know, through diversity came power, right? Eventually they came up with a really, really solid product. And now, you know, America has to prop up Boeing. Unfortunately, they're doing that. Well, I don't know. I don't want to speculate. Anyway, the, the thing is, so if you can't sell civilian airplanes, then you start selling military airplanes, and that's not right. good either. But anyway, the point my, my point is only that I think we shouldn't have allowed Google to mothball Google+. Plus. I think right. that we need to have an alternative Facebook, and that given that these companies are not being adequately taxed, the least they could do is be redundant for each other. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think, yeah, those systems need to be regulated. Um, right now, there's a lot of – it's very um, – privatized I guess like it's very like it's public but obviously that has it's a vacuum like it's causing a vacuum and now it kind of needs that regulation to be there otherwise we could have a promotion of hate speech for example or things like that so things need to be sort of um 
they need to be regulated, as you've mentioned. And you also brought up an interesting point um, about the biases that are in systems. It's not the corporations that are kind of building the systems. It's people that are building the systems. And, um, and the, the machine kind of reflects what the humans are feeling. So if we have a bias within ourselves, then the machine kind of reflects that. And it kind of sucks because to be a victim of that because, you know, it's just not fair. Well, I think I think that's a that's that you're you're only partly to to the the you, you've got part of it. So it can be so. For example, this thing about the soap dispenser, right? You know, the soap dispenser that and the, the people from South Asia, like already couldn't weren't weren't white enough to to get reflectance on the soap dispenser. That was amazing, right? But and there you think like again, either it was deliberate, which is possible. They meant to be excluding. They were bullying people, or there just wasn't anybody that wasn't Lily White working for that particular company because mm -hmm. nobody noticed that the soap dispenser wasn't working, right? But the but the um, but on the other hand, uh, it isn't it isn't just. I don't want to blame the developers. I think I think corporations do have to take executive control. Right. So 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 while developers probably do, it's just like the military. You know, we, it's post, it's post Nuremberg, so people are supposed to whistle blow, right? But still, ultimately, the, the, it's the hierarchy that, that's supposed to be in charge. You know, if, if there's war crimes committed, it's supposed to be the commander in chief that goes to jail. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't always happen, but it should. <laughs> and and uh, again, depending on the scale and who knew about what, but you know, if, if it was systemic, like invading a country that wasn't actively uh, in aggression with you, then, then yeah, the commander in chief should go in jail. So, the, um, so I think it's the same way with the corporations. On the same time, it isn't that necessarily that it happened. So, so if we make the, so our implicit biases, a lot of our implicit biases reflect, that's one of the things that our research from 2017 showed, that implicit biases are reflecting our actual lived experience. So it is less pleasant uh, to be from a minority in, our, in, in America. It is uh, more likely that you're, you have, you're associated with domestic things than career things if you're a woman compared to if you're a man, right? So those things are a part of our lived experience. And, and because of AI, we were able to measure that. We were able to find, so we originally were looking to see whether it was true that implicit biases could be recovered through AI. Because some people thought the implicit biases were just showing how evil we were or something. Mm -hmm. And we showed, no, these are regularities that are in our language. And so anything that's learning from language, whether it's like a little kid or, or a machine, like a really stupid, this is like, you know, this is not like, you know, a, again, not AGI, this is like, you know, a spreadsheet. But if it sees the words in that order, it will find out that there's those are the associations. Well, anyway, once we had the AI that measured that, we were able to show that AI was actually also really good at predicting actual facts about, uh, you know, who had jobs and things like that. Like, you know, that there were not very many women programmers and there were lots of women uh, nurses. And so what, what you're able to do then with AI is that, that once you've recognized that, you don't have to just leave the system there, right? You, and this is what we do consciously. So, so even though we may notice that there aren't that many uh, female programmers, we would never say anymore, we did in the 70s, we would never anymore say the programmer he. We think that's awful. And so you can, you can do the same kind of thing with AI. You can build in and say, okay, we want to compensate. And so that's a choice we make. And so we can use AI to make ourselves better than we really are, right? And, and I've heard, nobody wants to go on the record with this because they don't want to get sued. <laughs> but I've, I've talked to people that like are in, in human resources departments that say that AI has really, really helped them find when you're going through the massive stacks of CVs, like, again, your implicit biases, no matter how nice these people are, they're going through and whatever, how good, when they're going through massive stacks, the implicit biases kick in. Yeah. So if you can pop out the really good CVs, then you can use your explicit, you know, you like your, your desire to be proactive or, you know, either, either just fair or actually, you know, affirmative action, then you're able to do that. And so they're saying it's just wonderful that, that we're using these systems to, to correct the problems that we didn't want to have, but we did have. Um, but like I said, they don't want to be sued for the problems they did have. So they don't want to go on the record about this. But I heard it from multiple different companies. So. so you mentioned a really interesting use case for AI, which is in HR. So on this topic, um, we on the topic of AI, we've talked about like how many large language models like GPT-3 and BERT that have been trained on data that carry human biases. So how can we safely use these language models for NLP? Well, 
it, first of all, they're, they're trained on the biases that we express anyway. So it's, yeah. it's, it's not like it's more dangerous than talking to normal people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, which, which, so I, you know, I, 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 I find it weird. I guess it is a little more dangerous because there, are, there is this belief that machines are just right, which is wrong. <laughs> right? <laughs> they're, they're no righter or wronger than we are, as we just talked about. But as I, as I just mentioned, you, you can just go through, if you can enumerate what the prejudices are that you're worried about, which is not trivial, but you know, that's what we do. That's what, in anthropology, there's activists that go out and try to find what the things are. Then you can go through and, and watch for those things and correct for them. So, I mean, the, the most, uh, you know, the most uh, simple case of this that I could think of is um, you know, text prediction, that there's like a short list of words that your phone will generally not predict you're trying to type, even if you use them quite often, right? Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, so that's the kind of thing that you just, you just watch for certain kinds of contexts and then try to, to steer away from that. But I think it's really important, like the, the, I, some people are like, oh, we have AI now and so no bad things will ever happen. First of all, no. Yeah, the, the, the computational complexity is such that you will not get AGI. You will not suddenly have perfect omniscience and then be able to avoid bad things. That's just not how the world works. Mm -hmm. it, it, you, computation is never free, right? So, so there always is a cost. It always takes time. It always takes space. There will always be mistakes. But um, secondly, the, the um, oh, gee, I forgot where I was, I was going with that. Oh, we're talking about making mistakes. All right. The, but the point is, those mistakes have to be mistakes that reflect the values of either the owner operator or the developer, the developing organization and, and some interaction between that. Right. And that's one of the things we're figuring out with the law, going back to the checks and balances too. So, so who has which obligations, you know, if, if a, if a tech giant goes into a small country that does not have much technical capacity, or maybe they're an autocracy, like what are their obligations that are coming in there? You know, what are the rights to impose? I mean, because other people say, hey, this is our freedom. We chose to be an autocracy, right? <laughs> and yeah, somebody thinks it's a good idea. Right? And, and so you have to have these discussions and it's still a human process. It's absolutely about social science, about politics. You know, politics is not a bad thing. Politics is you have two people in the room and they got to negotiate over a resource, right? Mm -hmm. so, so getting people that are to be more informed about that, it's, some, it's the kind of thing we can't we should be able to do with AI we should be able to help people understand these complex processes better definitely so it is yeah there's some of the things we can do we can you we can choose to use uh, computers to help us but at the heart it's us we're developing the systems and we have to make those choices um thank you so much Joanna for giving us your time your insights are really valuable and I know our audience is really going to benefit from and enjoy from this interview so we'll be back with a new episode with a brand new expert soon. So stay tuned and we'll see you around for the next one. Thank you so much and we'll see you around. Nice to meet you. <laughs>